Let's take our Bibles again this morning and turn to 1 Peter chapter 2. Peter chapter 2, we're continuing through this great epistle, learning many things about salvation, and we will, I'll just give a short review and then get into what the passages that I'm going to look at this morning from verses 4 through 8 of chapter 2. Let's pray. Lord, this morning, as we do come before you, we want to... Uh, Come with humble hearts and teachable spirits. We want you, Lord, to break us down and build us up. We want you to take out of our life the things that ought not to be there and replace them with righteous behavior, right thinking, and things that are worthy of praise, things that are honor you. And I pray, Lord, that you would make us strong in our salvation, so Satan can't come al along with his lies and cause us to doubt and fear. I pray, Lord Jesus, that you would enable us today to every day be, receive the word, of, engraft the word of God, that it would build us to be soldiers of Jesus Christ, knowing, Lord, that we are in a spiritual battle and we really don't have a privilege of taking off our honor, armor. But, Lord, help us to know how to put it on and keep it. And, Lord, make us the people that honor you, speak for you, and if need be, to die for you. And I pray this in Christ's name. Amen. So we're looking at our passage of Scripture, and so far uh, we end it with this passage in verses 25, where it says, But the word of the Lord endures forever. And this is the word which was preached to you. And of course, we saw in, uh, by way of re review that we are living a new principle of life, and that new principle of life started when the seed of the word of God was planted in our heart. In verse number, back in verse number 23, you have been born again, not of seed which is perishable, but imperishable. And of course, the instrument of the in planting of the seed was the Word of God and is the Word of God as we continue to grow in it. Uh, and of course, the Word of God is enduring and living and everlasting, and it cannot perish, and whatever it plants in our heart becomes permanent. Also, we saw last time that there's, uh, the temporal was contrasted with the eternal, uh, and the, of course, the impermanent nature of the human being, uh, our natural man is like grass, for verse 24 of 1 Peter chapter 1. That means it's limited, it's short, it's uncertain, it's, it's full of trouble from the time of our birth through our life. And so that means the natural man will fade, will wilt, will dry up, and that is always the case. And what is always the case it's always the case that man will perish, man will pass away. He is not eternal in this world. His soul is. His soul will go to an eternal place, but his body will fade, will wither, and will pass away. And of course, that even the, the glory of the, the natural man will pass away, and the, by the glory we mean what is, what's attractive about the human life in the human being and what he accomplishes in his strength and in his wealth and his honor and his art and his education, all his achievements, his greatness, all of those, all its glories will be like a flower uh, and the grass that withers and the flower that falls off. See, so that is always the conclusion of our temporal life but contrast it with the new life we're given in Christ and by the, the word of God being implanted in our heart, we know that the word of God from this passage uh, endures forever and it is the word that we heard preached to us. It's the word that brought us the gospel of Jesus Christ. So that same word 
that is being preached today is the same word that Peter was talking about, and that same word is the very word that brings new life, and that new life lasts forever. And so we need to stop centering our attention on this life that will so quickly end and instead focus our attention on serving God and the new life that he's given, uh, given us uh, that starts now and will we'll go right past uh, this life into eternity. We need to start focusing our, our time and our life, our energies up, upon that. And uh, of course, how we continue that is that we saw already all these principles that uh, the Christian is to exhort, are exhorted by having a fixed hope in the future. Uh, they're exhorted to have a holy life. They are exhorted to fear God, to love one another. And of course, the last one that we uh, left off with last week is the, just the exhortation to crave the word of God. And how do they do that? How do we do that together? Well, we do it by stripping off the sinful desires that stifle spiritual growth, the first couple verses of chapter 2. Let me read them. It says, Therefore, putting aside all malice and all deceit and hypocrisy and envy and all slander, like newborn babes long for the pure milk of the word, so that by it you may grow in respect to salvation, if you have tasted the kindness of the Lord. So the second thing we do is by setting your heart on the uncontaminated, unadulterated Word of God that, of course, continues our spiritual growth. We, we can't get saved without the Word of God. We can't continue to grow without the Word of God. So in the process of being a believer, if you somehow are not involved with the Word of God for some reason, well, you're not going to grow. In fact, you have to look for your sin when that happens because sin is going to stifle, is going to quench your desire for spiritual things. In fact, this craving metaphor is not just for new or infant Christians, but it is a craving for all Christians at all times who are at all levels of spiritual growth. That desire for the Word should actually increase as you learn more of the Word, not decrease. And if it's not there at all, then you have to question whether you're saved at all. Because if this new life has been planted in you, it will create that desire. One of the first things that you notice about a new believer is they, they get right to the Word of God. They, they want the Word of God. And if you have no desire for that, if your desires are other places, you really have to question, where are you at? Or what sin is stifling your desire and quenching it? So Christians are to exemplify this intense yearning for the uncontaminated, unadulterated, pure spiritual milk of the eternal word of God that started at your salvation and that will continue forever. It's not going to end. It's going to just increase In fact, when we are released from this life into the presence of God, our desire for God will increase incredibly. Uh, We won't know that until we get on the other side. So the purpose for this nourishment for the pure milk of the word is for the believer to grow into the full experience of their salvation. The word of God will literally grow you, and therefore the Christian should take no spiritual nourishment, but from the Word of God. We don't have to settle for anything less than that, uh, especially spiritual junk food that's all out there, all over the place. And of course, that of course leads to something. In verse number three of chapter two, uh, it leads to us seeking the satisfier of our soul. It's not just the Word of God, it's the one who He's given us the word of God. If you notice, it says, if you have tasted the kindness of the Lord. So you see, so far from the word of God, we have learned several things that brings us to the place that we want more of the word of God when we know the goodness and the mercy 
and the kindness of God. We want more of it. We want more of God, not less of him. And so the word of God is the criterion and the measuring stick for uh, knowing what is good and the well-pleasing and, and advances spiritual maturity uh, so we can know God's will. And there's no other so- source that is perfectly safe and reliable to produce real spiritual growth and, growth and godliness than the unadulterated word of God. So, so far in our study of First Peter, we should be grasping so far this. Since he who begotten us is holy, his children are required to be holy, and that is something also the word of God produces by the spirit of God. And then secondly, since he is our judge and has ransomed us at such a great price, we his children must conduct ourselves in reverential fear before God because of who he is in his character and in his power. And since we are born again of the un- uncorruptible seed of the word of God, we are brethren and our relationship to each other must be one of sacrificial love because we are children of now one father and now we are in one family. And today we're going to see that we are now in one community or one temple uh, where we are to work and worship God. And then since we have been begotten by means of the eternal word of God, we should long for the milk of the word as our true and proper nourishment. So that brings me today to verse number four and to verse number eight, if I get that far today. And of course, in our passage today, there's an important message for this living church and those who belong to the church, the real church, the true church. Uh, if one term can describe it, is the, it's the word togetherness. We are now connected together We belong to each other because we belong to Christ. See, new life has been injected into the church by the living Christ, and we are begotten by the eternal word of God, and by the word we grow spiritually. So Christians are now living stones being built into a spiritual house. See, Christians meet together in the church, and that constitutes really a temple. The church is a temple. We are all filled with the Spirit of God. We all have the permanent dwelling of the Spirit of God, and when when we meet together, that is really the church, and the church is also synonymous to a temple, as we're going to see in our passage. But what happens in the temple in the Old Testament And what should happen in the temple in the New Testament, which is the church? Well, the same thing actually happens. First thing is that it's where the presence of God is. Anytime the temple was, that's where the presence of God was, and that's where the priest ministered, and that's where the people came. Secondly, it's where God communicates with his people through the eternal, enduring word of God. So when the word of God is open, God's communicating to us something that we all need to know and learn for our continued spiritual growth. And then also, the next thing is where God receives gifts and sacrifices, worship and prayers from his people. They did that in the Old Testament, and we actually do the same thing, but in a different way. So what what we're talking about here is practical holiness, This is how I practice my my relationship as a new believer in this new community called the church, which is equal to a temple where God dwells. So then, together, Christians are living stones in the same building. We are royal priests, as we're going to find out in 1 Peter, serving in the same temple, worshiping the same God, and finally, Christians belonging to the same community. So we're talking about really practical holiness. And the connection between verses 1 
2 and 3 in our text in the Semitic thought is between having children or that are alive and living that have been begotten by the Word of God to now coming into a family, which of course now constitutes a building, a place to meet with each other. And so having children and building a house kind of go together. Of course, the imagery is coming from the Old Testament, a metaphor of God building the church into a temple, the church being built as the new temple of, the li- of living stones upon the cornerstone, which is Christ himself. So it's talking in terms of a building. A building has to be built right to be strong. And one of the key stones in a stone building is a cornerstone. A cornerstone keeps everything in its place. It keeps all the measurements accurate, and it it gives strength to that building. So when considering the practice of holiness, there are three things to ponder concerning a Christian's new place in God's temple. And here's the first one. Together, Christians are living stones assembled into a spiritual house. Now, that means in the Old Testament, when people approached God, they had to approach God in a certain way. They couldn't just willy-nilly approach God. That could mean a person's death, actually. So if you notice in verse number 4, there's something I don't want you to miss in the beginning of verse number four, it says, and coming to him as to a living stone which has been rejected by men but is choice and precious in the sight of God. Now, verse number four, the phrase that is in very significant here is, and coming to him. So now that we are living stones, we can actually approach God. And our approach to God is important. I don't want you to miss this because this phrase is frequently used in the Old Testament for for drawing near to God, either to hear him speak or to come into his presence in the temple to offer sacrifice, usually, of course, a sacrifice for sin. It's uh, this verse, and coming to him, as to a living stone, Leviticus says this, and look what it says there on the screen. It says, Moses then said to Aaron, come near to the altar and offer your sin offering and your burnt offering that you may make atonement for yourself and for the people. Then make the offering for the people that you may make atonement for them just as the Lord has commandment. So drawing near to God was dangerous even deadly if people were not a, if people would were not approaching god in the right manner with the correct sacrifice the aaronic priesthood were the only ones who could actually approach god in behalf of the people no one else could do that the people had to bring their sacrifices to the priest and then the priest went before god the priest was the mediator between God, or the mercy seat, the presence of God, and the people themselves. The people could not go into the presence of God. They would, they, would, they would die immediately. So when a person wanted to approach God, the first step was to bring a burnt offering to the Lord, and they gave it to the priest, and the priest could offer it properly, before the Lord. So preparation was done uh, both by the people in bringing the offering and then by the priest. Now, for the the purpose of the, the burnt offering, which I want to just look at real quick, is this, that this was an offering that really changed God's attitude towards the people. And so what, what did the burnt, burnt offering actually do? Well, there was a fourfold thing going on when somebody came and offered the burnt offering, and of course the priest would offer it for the people, it was this, that they were to approach a holy God. Now, I'm not going to have you turn to all the passages, but I I do want to 
uh, draw your attention to some of them, and because in Leviticus 1.10, it says this, but if his offering is from the flock of, of the sheep or of the goats, for a burnt offering, he shall offer it a male without defect. So the person was to bring it to the tabernacle. Uh, he had to kill it and dismember it and then watch it go up and smoke before his eyes. And so the priest burnt everything apart from the skin. And so the worshiper, when they came, they were convinced that something very significant was achieved through these acts. And they knew that their relationship was, with God was profoundly affected by bringing an offering before God the proper way. So the second thing in the burnt offering is, was to be accepted by the Lord, to bring it in a way where you can be accepted by the Lord, and that's really part of it. Leviticus chapter 1, verse 3 says, If this offering is a burnt offering from the herd, he shall offer it a male without defect. He shall offer it at the door of the tent of meeting, and he, that he may be accepted before the Lord. So see, this offering was brought in the right way so you can be accepted by God and not rejected by him or not be put to death by him. And then a third thing, this burnt offering did what it was pleasing to the Lord. If you ever read in the Old Testament, like in Leviticus chapter 1, verse number 9, you get this kind of language where it says, uh, the priest shall offer up in smoke all of it on the altar for a burnt offering, an offering by fire of a soothing aroma to the Lord. In other words, it was an offering at that point that was pleasing to God, meaning that the person bringing it was pleasing to God. And in their heart, they wanted to be pleasing to God. That's why they were to be obedient to it. And then, of course, the last thing was the most important thing was to make atonement, to shed the blood of the animal so a person's sins could be covered for, of course, the Day of Atonement would be the, that one time a year that the high priest was able to come into the the presence of God. He, even the high priest couldn't come into the Holy of Holies but one time a year. So this term in verse number four, come to him, is also used in the New Testament in the book of Hebrews where it says, of course, this, this burnt offering uh, what really makes fellowship between sinful man and a holy God possible. All right? So in other words, you cannot come before God without an offering. Today, you cannot come before God without an offering. But the offering that we come before God is Jesus Christ, right? He is the offering. He is the ultimate and the last offering. So, see, I can approach God. Look at this passage here in Hebrews. It says, Therefore, let us draw near. Now, he's talking about the new community, the ones who have been redeemed by the blood of Jesus Christ. Let us draw near with confidence. We don't have to be afraid anymore. To the throne of grace so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in the time of need. So because of Jesus Christ, we're able now to come into the very presence of God, into his throne room, because our priest, Jesus Christ, has made that new and living way for us. The only burnt offering that has atoned for sin forever has been made by Christ. See, true worshipers no longer have to bring their lambs to the altar to receive forgiveness of sins, but instead bring a sacrifice involved with praising God for his grace and declaring one's attention to love God and to keep his commandments. So now the animal sacrifice, now that the animal sacrifices have been obsolete, that means praise and good works by themselves constitute a proper sacrifice accepted before God from a Christian who now is part of this new living community. So that means this, that together Christians are living stones that assemble together 
in a spiritual house. If you notice in verse number four, it says, and coming to him as a living, as to a living stone, that living stone is Christ, which has been rejected by men, but is choice and precious in the sight of God. So now, see, we come uh, to this particular place where we see that this living stone is, uh, is Christ himself, and this living stone, from the Father's perspective, is a stone that is choice and is precious. Now, stones are dead and pretty much lifeless objects. So to say Jesus is the living stone links him back to the Old Testament in verses such as Deuteronomy 32, 18, where it says, you neglected the rock who begot you and forgot the God who gave you birth. See, the stone imagery points to Jesus as being the strong stone and the living stone, and that Christ is not a dead idol. He is not a lifeless monument. He's not a dead principle. He is the living, resurrected, life-giving one. That's who Jesus Christ is. And so now he is that living stone, and that living stone to the Father is very, very profitable. Jesus is the one who gives life to those who come to him believing in his death and resurrection. But not all who encounter Jesus come with the same conclusion. In fact, in our text, if you notice what it says there, it says that it, this living stone has been rejected by men. Not all who hear about the glorious message of the gospel of Jesus Christ and him being our sacrifice on our behalf so we can come into the presence of God is always a welcome message to people. Some examine, examine Jesus and deem him useless, like apostate Israel. That's really what he's talking about partly here, and all unbelievers also. It's, it's like what John chapter 1, verse 11 says, he came to his own, and what does it say? And those who were his own did not receive him. Talking about the Jews, they didn't receive him. But others examine him, others hear the message of Jesus Christ and find him very profitable. But whatever the world or some religious system thinks of Christ, God the Father sees the suffering Christ as the living stone, costly, precious, extremely useful in his plan of redeeming humanity. That Christ is God's chosen and honored servant. Again, the Gospel of John chapter 1, verse 12, but as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God even to those who believe in his name. So we can now approach the living stone, Jesus Christ, and now we can assemble together in the church to worship God, the church now being the temple of God where God dwells amongst his people. So the next thing to ponder concerning the practice of the holiness and the new place that we have in God's temple is we are to, of course, all believers are priests. We are all believers are priests. Verse number five, look what it says. You also as living stones are being built up as a spiritual house for a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifice acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. Now, in looking at that passage of Scripture, it's kind of, it was a kind of an odd concept for me when I became a believer to think that I was a priest and to think that you are a priest. But the point of the passage of Scripture, it's saying this. We are priests that come before God. And we are priests that come with something. We come with a worshipful heart. We come with, in a sense, with a sacrifice that has already been made in our behalf. But that's the way 
we come. So the picture being drawn is that of God building the church into a temple. You are also, uh, as living stones are being built into this, in, up as a spiritual house for a holy priesthood. So the purpose of the temple was for the work of the priests. But here the Bible is telling us that all believers are priests. I don't know if you have considered that before. But today, if you are a believer, you are a priest. And you know what that means? As a priest, you have access to God. You have to come before no one to have access to God. Even more so than the Old Testament priest had. Only the high priest could enter the holiest place in the temple, and only one day a year. Well, the Word of God tells us that we are a spiritual house, a holy priesthood. And because of that, if you notice this passage here in Hebrews 10, verse number 19, therefore, brethren, since we have confidence to enter the holy place by the blood of of Jesus. So true believers in Jesus Christ are exhorted to go directly into God's presence with confidence, meaning we have freedom of speech when we enter the presence of God. We have courage to express ourselves in the presence of God, to bring before God our petitions and our prayers, our very presence. So that's a vast, vast difference in the way in which people uh, approach God in the Old Testament. We have a, the new covenant people, which we are. We approach God also, but without all the priestly duties that have to be performed, that's already taken care of. So new covenant people, approach their approach to God is confident and joyous, while old covenant people were cautious and fearful. New covenant people are to draw near always. Old covenant people were frequently exhorted to keep their distance, only approaching God regulated by the law itself. All followers of Christ are urged to come at any moment, any moment of peace or trial or at any time at all. They are encouraged to come before God while only the high priest could enter the holiest of all, and only one day a year. So followers of Christ are enter, entering into the Holy of Holies, into which under the old covenant, the people were forbidden to enter. Only the priest could. So we enter, not ignorantly, but mindful of the cost it took God to give believers this awesome privilege. To enter mindful of his blood that was shed, as we see in our passage, we are entered by the blood of Christ. Enter mindful of the way he opened. He opened up a way where we are, we are all accepted in the beloved, where it says in Ephesians. We come mindful of the work that he has done and continues to do, and we are helped. We can come before the throne of grace knowing God's presence is there because we are living stones in his temple, which he is the cornerstone. And so why do we come in that particular manner? So that when we come before him, the aspects of redemption may stir us to a, a full adoration and confession, a time of confession and thanksgiving, all equaling Worship that is pleasing to the Father. Now, again, if you notice in verse 20 of our passage on the screen, it says in verse number 20, by a new and living way which he inaugurated for us through the veil, that is his flesh. Now we're giving the information, if you look at that passage of Scripture, that this is a life-giving way, this is a new way. It is new because no one could directly enter God's presence under the law of Moses. And the word used there to uh, give us the sense of we can do this in, in a new way, it's actually a word that means to be freshly slaughtered. Fresh means not 
only in, it's, it's not only taking the sense that it is a way that was unknown before, but it also as one that retains its freshness and cannot grow old. You see, although his sacrifice for our sins was a once and for all sacrifice over 2,000 years ago, it never grows old. It's always fresh and current for all who come to receive it and all who come to confess their sin, like in 1 John chapter 1, verse 7. If you confess your sin, he's what? Faithful and just to forgive you of your sins and to cleanse you from all your unrighteousness, meaning the power of the blood of Christ is fresh for all believers to make them clean so they can approach God on a regular basis in this new and living way. And it is living because the way provides life for believers and continual access to God. And that also means this, too, that all other ways to God are dead ways. There's no other living way than coming through Christ. And if you notice in the first part of verse number 20, it says, or the last part of it, is that it was inaugurated through, uh, through, for us through the veil. And what's the veil? Well, the veil was the, the place in the temple where the high priest can only go once. On the other side of the veil was the mercy seat where he came in once a year. So the veil here in this passage of Scripture is the flesh of Christ. And so the veil had to be torn in two before this old Judaistic culture could be done away with and the temple closed up, at least the physical temple. And so everything ended when that took place, when Jesus inaugurated for us through the veil that is his flesh, this new and living way, because the Lord... God was pleased to crush him in Isaiah 53.10, putting him to grief if he would render himself a guilt offering. And Jesus became that. And so we see that as the priest was in the holy place, what he, what he was doing there, it says in Hebrews chapter 9, verse 2, for there was a tabernacle prepared, the outer one, in which were the lampstand and the table and the sacred bread. This is called the holy place. So the priest ministered in that area all the time. But where that curtain was in the back, that had to be removed so a person could have access without going through a priest to the mercy seat where someone's sin would be completely forgiven and washed away by the one-time sacrifice of Jesus Christ. And so we see that the priest ministered there, and then on that particular day, where it says in Hebrews chapter 9 and verse number 3, it says, blessed, behind the second veil, there was a tabernacle which is called the Holy of Holies, and that was called the most holy place, where on that particular day when Jesus Christ was on the cross, we notice that this is the language that is used in a passage of Scripture in Mark chapter 15, and even in the other Gospels, if you notice what it says there, it says, and Jesus uttered a loud cry and breathed his last, and the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom when the centurion who was standing right in front of him, saw the way he breathed his last. He said, truly, this man was the Son of God. So I'm saying all these things to give you all the background of what Peter is bringing up in these passages of Scripture, that the Lord had to remove a whole religious system, a whole priesthood, so you and I can have complete and total and free access to God. And in doing that, you know what that means? That means this, that 
Priests, priests are those who bring sacrifices and offerings to God. It's not changing with us. The only thing that changes is what we bring and how we bring it and how often we bring it. That's what changes. And what am I talking about? Well, let's go to 1 Peter chapter 2, verse number 5, and notice what it says. You also, as living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house for a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. So we are to come to offer up spiritual sacrifices, not literal animal sacrifices, but spiritual ones, and we are to do it through Jesus Christ. There's no way we could bring our sacrifices to God unless we come through Jesus Christ. You can't bypass Jesus Christ. Jesus must be dealt with and must be responded to. So Christ is the instrument by which we can approach a holy God to worship, to serve, to live in his presence. And this house is a temple or a sanctuary in which God dwells and receives spiritual sacrifices from us as his priest in his temple. The corporate community with their transformed lives are to offer up acceptable sacrifices to God. Okay, what are Christians as a holy priesthood to do? What, what are we to bring to God? Well, we are to offer up to God, as it says here, acceptable sacrifices. Actually, the word is really has a stronger meaning than just acceptable. It means very acceptable. Christ has opened up a way right into the Holy of Holies where only a handful of Old Testament priests were ever allowed to come. But now we stand before the mercy seat because we have been accepted in the Beloved. See, the more we know God from Scripture and we taste His goodness and His kindness, we want more and more. Then the greater desire we have to worship him, but to worship him properly, not flippantly, not haphazardly, but properly. And to know we're doing that is what Peter is getting at in our text. And so what, how, what does that mean? What is, what is actually acceptable spiritual worship? Well, I want you to take your Bibles, and I want you to turn to... Romans chapter 12, verse number 1 and 2, because the other passages of scriptures bring out what it is that, that Peter's talking about concerning acceptable worship. And here's the first thing we're to bring. Here's acceptable worship. We are to bring ourselves. We're to bring ourselves. And what does that mean? Our bodies as a living sacrifice. Look at Romans 12, verse 1 and 2. Therefore, I urge you, brethren. Now, now keep in mind that Paul is bringing this up after 11 chapters of pretty heavy doctrine. He's saying after all that heavy doctrine and all that theology, this is the practical part of what you do when you know those things. Chapter 12, verse 1 Therefore, I urge you, brethren, what's the urge by? The mercies of God. You know what the mercies of God are? It's the compassion of God. It's the pity that God had on you and I when he saw us as unholy, as unrighteous, as rebellious. That's when God had mercy on us. So because of his mercy towards us, that's the motivation I have to offer myself a living sacrifice. Look at the rest of the passage. It says, Therefore I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice acceptable to God. For this is your spiritual service of worship. 
And verse 2, and do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. So here is my, as a priest coming into his temple, as I fellowship corporately with his people, what am I to do? I am to offer myself, my body, yes, my body. Not as a dead sacrifice to be slaughtered and have my blood shed or your blood shed. No, as a living sacrifice. All right? As I give my life to God because of the mercy he had towards me. And now his mercy motivates me to every day say to the Lord, Lord, I'm giving myself up to you as a sacrifice so I can live my life in the way you want me to. And I want my life to be acceptable and I w- because I know this is my reasonable service of worship. That's what worship is. See, when God saves us, he wants all of us. Not part of us, all of us. And so I'm conscious that I am giving myself to God as a holy, separated, different person who's now living, and that sacrifice becomes acceptable to the Lord. And of course, the rest of the passage of Scripture explains that. But I'm to give myself. You're to give yourself. That's part of our worship as a priest before God. And that's a conscious thing we do. Because you know what? We're, we're really selfish. We don't want to give it all to God. We want to keep little compartments for ourselves. And, and until we do that, we really cannot worship God. Because we're not loving him, we're loving other things, and we're loving ourselves, and we're loving things we'd like to do and like to have and not loving him. Because we think somehow giving it all to the Lord is going to be stifling to our life. And that's not true at all. We really learn to have life when we give it all to the Lord. All our service, all our thinking, all our doing, all our planning to the Lord. Lord, whatever you want, I want to do, but I want to do it serving you, not sitting by the sidelines. And then secondly, another passage I want you to turn to, and that's found in Hebrews chapter 13. Again, it's using the same language that Peter is using in his text here that explains more of what it means for us as priests to come before God with acceptable worship. Okay, Hebrews chapter 13, verse number 15. This is what it says. It says, through him then, Hebrews 13, 15. I'll wait till you find it. It says, through him then, let us continually offer up a sacrifice of praise to God. That is the fruit of lips that give thanks to his name. So you know the second thing we do in offering up acceptable worship to God? We give our bodies as a living sacrifice, but we give our words. How we, you know, how we speak tells me and God what's going on in my heart. The words that are coming out of your mouth are not a mistake. But these words are words directed to God. And these are words that I offer up a continual sacrifice of praise to God about the great things God has done for me and has given me in Christ Jesus, of which I never and you would have never deserved ever in a million trillion years. It only came through Christ. And so what what it does, it loosens up my lips that my mouth begins to bear fruit of giving thanks to the Lord. Again, you don't see any grumbling and complaining here. You don't see anything negative here like, oh, Lord, you don't really understand my situation, what I'm going through. Nobody's gone through what I go through. No. The Lord has gone to the limits of what suffering is, way farther than we could ever go. And he understands our deep suffering. It says that in Hebrews too. But so what do we do, what do, we do every day? We get up. And we learn how to praise God. 
Thank you, Lord, for my health. Thank you, Lord, for my food. Thank you, Lord, for a place to sleep last night. Thank you, Lord, every day for my salvation. Thank you, Lord, for the people in my life. Thank you, Lord, for the body that I'm part of. Thank you, Lord, for you and your word. And I'm able to read it and, and, and hear what you have to say. So, see, in other words, it starts cleaning up what comes out of our mouth. And most of what starts coming out of our mouth as we grow in Christ-likeness and holiness is praise and thankfulness to God. And we kind of shut off the bitter, the bitter waters that come out. You can't have bitter and fresh water coming out of the same fountain. I think James said something about that. So what's my worship? My words. But my words come from my heart. And my heart is full of affection for God when I'm a believer because I have something new and living going on inside of me. I know what God has done. I know who he is. I don't have to wonder about his plan. And I want to live for him. I want to give myself to him. And that doesn't mean you leave everything and you go off to Bible college or leave it. No, right where you're at, right in your sphere of life, you serve God. And what comes out of your mouth is not bitterness and cursing and grumbling and complaining, and, but is praise and is fruit of thankfulness. Being so thankful that you just can't help yourself. That's worship. That's what real worship is. And God knows your heart, and he knows if you're really doing that every day. So you can come on, you come to church, you can put on a good face. You can fake it, you know? And then you get back in the car, and it's all, it, it all, whatever you got, just you, in your little thimble, you spill it in the parking lot, or wherever they say, you know what I mean? And, you, and you, you, didn't you learn anything? Are, are you thinking you can get away? We can get away with those things as, believe, as calling ourselves believers and it not have repercussions? See, look at your words, all right? Because your words ought to be words of praise and thanksgiving. And when they're not, look for your sin and look for what's going on in your heart that is not right. Because this is what a priest does who's a believer who has new life in their heart. This is what he does. This is what she does. She comes to God with that kind of attitude. And then there's a third passage of Scripture that I want you to see, and it's found right there in Hebrews chapter 16, or chapter 13, verse 16. It says this, And do not neglect doing good and sharing For with such sacrifices, God is pleased. You see how the language is all tied together from Peter? That this this is what we ought to do. This is how we worship God. Our works and our service, you just don't sit on the sideline as a believer. You're involved in the game. And so we should not neglect doing good. Anytime we have a chance to do good, we ought to do it. And then if you notice, there's two things he mentions there, is that of doing good and sharing. Giving of what we have and sharing it with others who possibly don't have. So God is concerned of our relationships with one another in the area of doing the ordained works that God has given us to do while we're here on this earth. And God notices in all these, God sees it all. God's pleased. He sees the... the the works we do. He knows what's coming out of your mouth. He knows if you're giving yourself over to live for him or or not. He knows that. But see, he wants you to know that. He wants you to know that you do that. Yeah, you don't do it perfectly. You never will. I never will. But I do it. And you should do it. And be conscious of doing it because worship is not something that you're not conscious of what's going on. Worship is I am very conscious of who I'm I'm worshiping and how I'm worshiping. Those both things go together. A passage of Scripture that kind of brings some of these things and includes them is in Philippians 4. Don't turn there. Listen to what it says, Philippians 4.18. But I have received everything in full and have in abundance 
I am amply supplied and have, having received from Epaphroditus what you have sent, a fragrant aroma, an acceptable sacrifice, well-pleasing to God. And my God will supply all your needs according to his riches in glory in Christ Jesus. Paul was just saying, listen, when I'm well-fed, I'm not going to let my uh, wealth change my attitude towards God and forget God if I'm wealthy enough to take care of my needs. But if my stomach's growling, I'm not going to reject God because he hasn't supplied something that I think he should supply and curse him because now I don't have food to eat. He says, none of those matter anymore. I'm content with whatever God has for me at that point in my life. And godliness with contentment, the Bible says, is great gain. Great gain. So we offer these spiritual sacrifices through Jesus Christ. And what God desires most of all is the love of our hearts and the service of our lives. And just to be clear, we are not giving offerings for sin. Old Testament offering for sin like the burnt offering, the sin offering, the guilt offering, all these have been fulfilled and completed in Christ Jesus, our high priest, forever. After not the Ir- not Aaron's priesthood, but the order of Melchizedek, the spiritual priesthood. Therefore, through Christ, our mediator, we have acceptance and access to God. Through his word, we gain a greater and a clearer knowledge of God, which means a more conscious understanding of how to worship and what God requires in worship, and are we really doing that? And if we're not, to correct it. So, again, Peter is bringing out these things to let us know that this is who we are in our new life. So I pray, I'm going to end it there this morning. I'll pick it up in our next section in verse 6 through 8 of uh, 1 Peter. Let's pray. Lord, this morning we thank you again for the awesome word of God. Lord, it is convicting and it does tear us down, but it also is life-giving and it builds us up. And Lord, I thank you for what we find in the word of God because, Lord, in it we see that you have done something that no one else could do. You, ha- you have made a way for us into your, the holiest place uh, as priests coming into your presence to offer you worship that is acceptable in your sight. Only through Christ can this ever be. And I just pray, Lord, as we consider that, that, Lord, we would look at ourselves and examine ourselves to see and to evaluate whether Our worship is worship that is lining up with Scripture and comes out of our growth from understanding the Word of God. And I pray as we we see that, Lord, as we're honest with ourselves, Lord, let our worship be worship that is lining up with Scripture and that is real, that comes from the depth of our heart because of our great affection that we have for you based on all that you have done for us and the great mercy you had offered to us by not allowing the wrath of God to fall on us, but had pity on us and rescued us by the sacrifice of your son. Thank you for that. And I pray that you would make us these kind of people for your sake, for the building up of your church, for the advancement of the gospel. And I pray in your name. Amen. Let's stand together.